Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Philip Less, Daniel Dorado, and Howard Yermish. Coming up on DTNS, Twitter, Telegram, and now Snap want to sell you a subscription, but they're not giving us what we want in a subscription. Plus, cyber pirates at sea. That's literally true. And tech to end bicycle theft. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, June 29th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Wednesday's Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. You know, it is a lost opportunity to uh, book someone named Wednesday. I know. You'll never do it, though. That's a rare thing. You'll you'll find a million Scott Johnsons, no Wednesdays. Yeah, that's that's the old saying. In a world of a million Scott Johnsons, Mm -hmm. there are so few Wednesdays. Where are the Wednesdays? (laughs) Well, this is a Wednesday, and so we start with a few tech things you should know. Mozilla released Firefox 102 with a feature that strips tracking information for the end of URLs. Links sometimes include a question mark followed by a bunch of numbers and letters. You might look at that and say, what does it mean? That's one of the most common ways to add tracking to links. Firefox's query parameter stripping feature, as it is so pluckily called, takes that tracking info off of the URL when you click it and when you paste it into your address bar. You do need to turn it on yourself in the privacy and security settings under enhanced tracking protection. One of the five U.S. commissioners, Brendan Carr, former aide to Ajit Pai, shared a letter sent to CEOs at Apple and Alphabet alleging that TikTok functions as a sophisticated surveillance tool and does not comply with App Store policies of either company. Carr asked each company to provide statements on why the app was allowed to remain up by July 8th. U.S. District Judge William Oreck in San Francisco ruled that former Uber security chief, uh, chief security officer Joseph Sullivan will face wire fraud charges over an alleged role in trying to cover up a 2016 cyber attack that leaked information on millions of drivers. Prosecutors allege that Sullivan agreed to pay the attackers $100,000 in Bitcoin and sign non-disclosure agreements saying that they didn't steal the data. Uber settled claims by all 50 U.S. states regarding the data leak back in 2018 for $148 million. I just realized something. Brendan Carr should have read his letter on TikTok and then put it out there for duets. He would have got even more people paying attention to it. (laughs) Uh, Nothing confirmed to input that its upcoming phone will use Qualcomm's Snapdragon 778G Plus system on a chip. That's the mid-range one, uh, customized to offer wireless charging and reverse wireless charging. Founder Carl Pay said the decision to use a mid-range chip came down to performance, power consumption, and of course, cost. The Central Bank of Taiwan has reportedly finished trials of its central bank digital currency and is ready to make it available for public retail use. No timeline was announced for the rollout, however. Taiwan's central bank governors said that the public must be educated about the benefits and a legal regulatory framework must be put in place before launch. But the technology itself is ready. Ooh, CBDCs, you know, because you listen to this show, you know they're on the way. Here comes another one. All right, uh, let's talk about those subscription services I mentioned. Well, why not? Let's start with Snap. They began offering a $3.99 a month subscription called Snapchat Plus because everyone uses Plus now. Anyway, offering uh, exclusive and early access features. Currently, it lets you change the app icon, see who's rewatched your stories, and pin a friend to the top of the chat history. Snap does not expect this to be much of a material new revenue source. That's an actual quote. And expects ads will remain, quote, the core of our business model. Note that this subscription does not remove ads. Uh, Nevertheless, subscriptions are all the rage. Snap's latest effort joins Twitter's premium service, Twitter Blue. Telegram's got their Telegram premium. And there's always been or has been for quite a while Nitro from Discord as examples of popular services that are free but charge for little extra features here and there. So let's go through some of these offerings and talk about who they might be for. Yeah, yeah, because honestly, everybody says they want a subscription that removes ads. Uh, so Snap not doing that, I think, uh, is is going to raise some eyebrows. Uh, Twitter Blue is only three bucks a month, slightly cheaper than Snap's four dollars a month. Uh, it does not remove ads. It removes ads from articles you click on from partners, <laughs> which 
is very limited, uh, but it does give you custom app icons. My, Duolingo does this too. I, I pay for Duolingo for other reasons, but it does things like custom app icons. There's also uh, themes, uh, top articles. You get undo tweaked. I guess that's the big one. Yeah, that's the one that's supposed to be the big one. Real quick, I just wanted to say um, that the the undo tweet feature is horribly implemented, and we can talk about that later. Mm. <laughs> well, uh, over you mentioned Discord Nitro, Scott, and I, I know a lot of folks who pay for this. It's nine ninety nine per month with a server boost. Otherwise, five dollars a month without. You get sort of the same type of you know expanded and custom emoji options. You can have an animated avatar. Let you stand out a little bit. Profile badges. Uh, if you want to upload something, uh, anything above 100 megabytes is allowed if you've got Nitro. And you also have the capability to do HD video and screen share. I don't know a ton of folks who use Discord for HD video, but I, I know you're out there. So this actually seems like one of the offerings that makes the most sense to me. Yeah. If you're but really if you're really into Discord. Doesn't mm. let you change the uh, the app icon though. Mm. What good is it? Oh man, for Ooh, net ten bucks, yeah. they should let Very you change good that. Good point. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Larry Delatta in our chat points out you can just use Nova Launcher to change any app icon. You don't have to pay anybody for it. Uh, anyway, uh, Telegram Premium rolled out June nineteenth. That one's five dollars a month. Uh, it actually removes ads, Woo. so that's one that people might go, yeah, that, that's enough. I'll do that. Also increases your download uh, top level from two to four gigabytes, offers faster downloads, doubles a lot of things like the amount of channels you can have, chat folders, uh, favorites, uh, accounts on an app. Uh, you can do nice little cosmetic things like longer bio. Uh, also does voice to text if you pay for it. Uh, and then lots of other like gifts and stickers and badges and app icons that are specific uh, to premium. But no ads. That is nice. I will say this. The one problem I have with uh, with Twitter is that they're inconsistent with their implementation. And these other two examples, and you could add others to this like YouTube premium and others that are more web-based services, but they have apps and so on. So, you know, you could argue what those are. But uh, my problem with Twitter Blue was, and I used it for a month, I was I was really curious. And I thought, well, I'll pay for this if this is you know, going to be beneficial to me. And the number one thing there was undo tweet. And the promise there was you'll be able to not only undo the tweet. Yeah, uh, it's what, like what everyone service. on Twitter has been asking for, for, you know, next since to the edit button. Yeah, That's next to the, the edit button. Best, this next is the thing, right? Yeah, yeah in yeah. fact, this is the thing people say, well, if you're not going to give us edit, give us this. So it's there on mobile. It's horrendous. You, you'd use this feature and it sends you somewhere completely different than the, where you originally were. Now, they may have fixed this in the last month, but I couldn't get off of that thing fast enough because it drove me crazy. The web Im implementation, totally fine. No hmm. issues. Weird. Worked as designed. Uh, so I feel like they fumbled a little bit on their subscription because their number one selling feature was just kind of borked on mobile. Um, but Nitro, I get Nitro and wasn't sure about it until I got it. I thought, well, what's the harm in doing the free trial? And I ended up sticking with it um, just for larger uploads, not even HD video so much, although mm -hmm. that's a decent advantage when you're doing conference with people or whatever, but larger than 100 megabyte files uh, is massive um, compared to what they give you uh, as the default service. So I think it just sort of depends on what you weight as a an important feature. And in Telegram's case, maybe it is no ads. In Twitter's case, maybe it is undo. And maybe in Nitro's case, their big selling point, at least to me, is the is less limits on size of files. But subscriptions are clearly the future, folks. We're here. We're doing it. We're going. That, yeah. that said, though, I mean, when I'm looking at what Snapchat Plus is offering, and granted, I haven't used Snapchat in any regular capacity for years now it's Same, yeah. it's i'm just i'm just kind of off i'm off the platform even though i you know I, I check in once in a while but i go all right uh changing app icon that might matter to you see who rewatched stories starts to get a little weird to me unless you're a brand and that is really good intel for you to have of you know who might be coming back to this you know content that you're offering that uh, is 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 designated to promote something over and over. Otherwise, it's like, mm, this is kind of starts to get into weird territory. Um, pinning a friend to the top of a chat history. Okay. I mean, none of this sounds like something I would pay $4 a month for. But again, not the target audience, and I haven't been for some time. It's interesting what some of these platforms do. And, and in Snap's case, 
I mean, it said quite, quite frankly, we don't really think this is going to bring up in a bunch of money. So you might go, well, why did the company even bother? Yeah. I think they just want to see who pays because maybe they're wrong. Mm -hmm. it, it's really interesting. I, I think you're right, Scott, that subscriptions are on the way. Uh, I don't know which of these are actually more successful, but I can tell you Discord and Telegram's list look to my eyes like they paid attention to features people were asking for and provided those. Uh, whereas Twitter and Snap look like they came up with features they wanted to make uh, or sort of tried to come up with easy stuff they could sell. And both Twitter and Snap say, well, this really isn't the final form. This is really just a test. We're really just trying things out. Whereas Discord and Telegram are like, this is our subscription product. Please, if it sounds compelling, subscribe. Uh, yeah. So you can tell the difference in those lists. Yeah. I do think it's interesting that most of them come down to one or two things that will grab people. Whereas the rest feels really fluffy, even in Discord's case. It's like, do I really need anim animated avatars? I guess it's a nice perk if you're paying and you may as well use it. But is it really that big a deal? More emojis? I mean, really? We got thousands of them. Do we really need more? Like, a lot of these don't sell me until I see one item. Larger uploads and HD screen share. Those yeah. are the two. That and then the other stuff make you feel like you're getting more for your money. Like, oh, I sure. wouldn't have paid for the emojis. But, oh, it's nice to have this one right now that I wouldn't have. Otherwise. And that's what I'm saying is I feel like yeah. Snap is missing Yes, yeah, Snap is that only is. the fluffy stuff. Yeah, it's all fluff. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about riding bicycles, shall we? I don't currently own a bicycle. I wish I did because riding a bike is fun. Uh, but <laughs> if you have one, you know, there are a lot of advantages. You can weave through otherwise stopped traffic if you live in an urban area. It's good exercise. It's fun. And you only emit a small amount of CO2 that you're ex ex exhaling from your body <laughs> while you're riding your bike. That's true. We are all uh, carbon emitters. Uh, there are lots of reasons why more people don't ride bikes, though. Uh, and one of them in most parts of the world is theft. Uh, when you get to your destination, you either have to take your bike with you inside. I used to do that at, at some of the places I worked. Uh, or go through quite a bit to secure it with multiple locks or even wheel removal. Uh, make one mistake and your bike might be gone or mostly gone. <laughs> Everything but that one wheel uh, might be left uh, when you get back. Yeah, this is uh, in, in in certain places a pretty rampant problem. In fact, a friend of mine just had a, a real nice bike stolen from his garage at home and was not happy, understandably. MIT Technology Review has an article about a startup called Uni, that's O-O-N-E-E, -E, that's developing a kit for modular parking pods that can securely, so they say, store 8 to 80 bicycles at a time, even scooters. Because scooters are, you know, more or less the same form factor. If you want to protect your bike from rain and snow, also a nice bonus depending on where you live. Riders can use a key card or a smartphone to unlock a pod, each of which have a security camera. So the implication is that it is safe. And if it isn't safe, we'll know who did it. Membership is free and includes insurance against theft. So you might say, cool, sounds great. How does Uni make money? The company says it sells ads on the outside of the pod structures. Of course it does. Oh, like a park bench kind of thing. <laughs> right. I mean, which is, and, and listen, that's it, That's not a terrible idea. It's just, you know, it, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel. Ha ha. Mm -hmm. Uni launched in New York City and Jersey City, both in New Jersey, uh, <laughs> a state in the U.S., and has about 4,000 users with plans to expand. So it's, it's, a, it's a small amount of folks at this point. But, man, if you're a bicyclist, this might really, really appeal to you. Yeah, I thought they were in New York, uh, but but uh, I, I may be wrong about that. One thing I definitely was wrong about is I thought these were locks, uh, and Roger uh, told told me in the in the pre show meeting he's like, no, I think you have to provide your own lock, and he was absolutely right. Uh, if you go to the fact, they're like, yeah, you get access to the pod, then you lock the bike up. Yeah. Uh, so really, the theft prevention here is making it another step to get to your bike. You have to you have to unlock the pod. So I'm not sure how safe this is because anybody can have a free membership and unlock the pod and then get at your bike, which is just using the same lock that you were using before. Now, granted, they're adding security cameras and they're insuring your bike. So they're putting their money where their mouth is. 
Uh, and and I guess that means they think it's enough of a of a dissuasion to have that camera there and the extra step of having to get in the the pod uh, that it'll keep people from stealing it. But I thought this was going to be a lot more ironclad. I had imagined when I first saw the headline that this would be a single pod. You'd put your bike in. Someone would have to break into the pod to even get at your bike. Uh, instead, it's more of just like a bike rack locked behind a door. Yeah, at the very least, I thought maybe the pods would have a way to isolate your bike and lock it in place uh, as part of the functionality of the pod. Instead, what they're really just saying is, well, what if you still locked your bike, but you did it within the storage container? I mean, that's really the difference here. That, and, yeah, that, you know. that sounds, which is sure. That's one more level of protection. If somebody, mm -hmm. somebody really wants to steal a bike quickly, they might go, eh, the pod is too complicated. I'll find another bike. Um, and, I know in San Francisco in particular, I mean, the the bike theft issue, I, I know this happens a lot of other places. I, I mean, it's such a big deal. It's it's people go through so many hoops to try to make sure that their bike is not stolen, even if it's securely locked up in a garage where nobody has the key to your garage. I mean, theft happens. And so I, I feel like the you know the, the promise of these pods is like, well, that's cool. But all somebody has to do is figure out how to get into the pod, and then it's it's the same story. And that would be the same case if it was in, you know, the foyer of your apartment building. Yeah. yeah. If anything, whenever any time somebody comes by and opens the pod to get their bike, normal, you know, pod access to get your bike back, you are at least temporarily saying, "Here's an open pod full of all these bikes." And well, also, yeah. it's a free membership. Yeah. Anybody can create an account and say whatever they want on the account. Use a burner phone and get in and get yeah. the bikes. So yeah. I, I don't know. I think what I do like about Uni is that they are trying to force the conversation about bicycle parking and saying like, look, when, when you build a building, you talk all kinds of ways about how are the cars going to get in and out? Where are they going to park? Uh, nobody talks about bicycle parking. Everybody builds bike lanes and doesn't do any bicycle parking. So I like the fact that they are at least doing that. So maybe if you mm -hmm. focus less on the theft and more on just the idea of like comfortable out of the rain bicycle parking, this is worth it right there, especially because again, it's free. They're subsidizing it with ads. And I imagine they get a little money from the city to install these two. Yeah. It may be pretty them up. They're kind of bulky and ugly. I'm just, you know, I'm not really? sure. I that. thought they look kind of nice. They look okay. They just look like I they're just they looked all right. Here's a thing. It's like, it's like those communication containers. They just plop down in Chinese cities and say, all right, you have internet. And it's just kind of a big, <laughs> ugly, gnarly blob. Oh, you know no, I, mean? I thought they had like nice rounded corners and look kind of spacey. No, no? It looks like, it I, looks like somebody you're the dropped cargo. Though, so I, I know I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like dropped cargo from a plane or something. I don't know. I can't tell how I feel about that yet. I, I also, I, I do not condone theft of any kind, particularly bicycle theft. And I wonder where, we, you know, like what's the big bicycle black market? Because... Clearly, bikes are being stolen to be sold, and mm -hmm. I just don't know. Like, I don't, I don't know who, who that, who, who, who are the people that are all involved in something where it's so lucrative to steal bikes all the time? Yeah, yeah it, the, I, I often wonder that myself, but I also just accept that it's absolutely true because bikes are stolen all the time. Yeah, right? totally. Must be yeah. a big old market, some kind of something going or, on. Or, or it's just steal for use. I can't yeah. afford a bike, so I'm just gonna take one could be yeah 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 uh well folks uh what do you think about this you think this solves bike theft are you living in new york city or jersey city and you, you've been used one of these uh let us know on the socials you can get in touch with us on twitter at dtns show and on instagram dtns picks dtns pix we are happy to hear from you please do it Bloomberg reports that in February 2019, a container ship bound for New York detected a malware attack on its ship systems. Now, fully autonomous ships are just beginning to be tested, so it wasn't like they could you know, take over a, a boat without any people on it. Uh, but many cargo ships have automated systems for steering, propulsion, navigation, and other operations. Thankfully, the February intruder never gained control of the vessel's movements, at least not that time. But attacks can hit ports, not just ships. India's busiest container port suffered a ransomware attack this past February. That same month, a targeted attack against a freight forwarder in Washington critically affected its systems for about three weeks. And in May, a supply chain company in California temporarily lost access to its access, uh, asset management platform. It means 
couldn't couldn't tell where its stuff was supposed to be. A security company called Blue Voyant surveyed shipping companies and found 93% of them had suffered a direct breach with the average number of intrusions rising from 2.7 per company in 2020 to 3.7 last year. And that affects our logistics quite a bit because around 80% of global trade goes by sea. You may think about trucks, you may think about planes, but most of it's going by sea. So there's a large and lucrative surface area for attack. The good news is shipping companies have money to spend right now and are equipping their fleets and new ships with real-time tracking devices and sensors that can connect to the shore and report problems instantly. The bad news is all those sensors and connectivity provide another avenue of attack and also need to be secured, not to mention the shore-based systems that need to be secured. In order to secure new tech, especially in older vessels, the UN's International Maritime Organization has issued some guidelines for safety and security for companies to adopt. They issued that starting in 2021. They aren't exactly pleased with the uptake, though. The challenge at sea is the same as it is on land. Companies may not take a threat seriously until it happens to them. And the reason they want to rationalize that is because the cost and time it takes to implement proper security is not small. It makes it hard for those arguing for preventative measures. So there's that. And then, like every other industry, we also need more communication. We need companies to share information on attackers with each other so they can all prevent the attacks. And companies just aren't used to sharing information with each other easily. So uh, it's, it's kind of the same story we have on land. It's just also at sea because connectivity is reaching out into the ocean. Also seems like you, I know there are shipping lanes and, you know, certain, uh, you can't just kind of willy nilly go wherever you want in terms mm -hmm. of international waters and that sort of thing. But I'm surprised to hear that it's 80% of global trade happening there. But then the, knowing that that much is happening, that much is being transported via water and then have the companies act like, well, we're, we're not really, we, uh, we'll, we'll wait until it happens to us. I mean, I know they're not saying that, but they're they're not reacting. But as dragging their feet, to, but but we've seen that with every company. The reason it happens yeah. with a C company is no different than the reason it happens with your bank or or credit bureau or whatever, right? Yeah, that's true. I guess, I guess what I'm saying is it seems like, I don't know, for some reason I'm thinking of space, forgive me for one second. Um, when we get to space, I always go, man, all these ideas of space pirates, that's so overblown. There's so much room up there that you're never going to have to go anywhere where someone's going to know where you are. You'll always have it to yourself. Sure. And then I hear this about the water and I'm like, it's kind of like that on a smaller scale. So maybe it is a thing we should think about and worry about. And well, because two two things. One is you do the attack when it's coming into a port. So it's you can keep track of the ports a lot easier than, than the routes in between, right? Sure, sure. And mm -hmm. with the connectivity... You don't have to be next to it. True. You just need to be able to get to it over the internet. And if it's always connected, that means you can always get to it. Yeah. yeah I mean, if you were, if you're a large container ship uh, carrying something that somebody might want and the port, you, even if you knew, oh, shoot, the port I'm coming right into is getting attacked right now. It's like, what are your options? There aren't really. I mean, we there. You, you, you have a path. That's the way you got to go because nobody else can accept you. Uh, you know, uh, you know, on demand. And I don't know. That might be something that changes in the future, um, especially with autonomous cargo ships. But I, uh, at this point, I think it's yeah. I mean, it's it's a real problem. I think the mm -hmm. risk is less that somebody wants to uh, get the cargo, although I think that is a risk. Uh, but more ransomware. Ransomware is where it's at, right? So mm -hmm, I'm going to lock mm -hmm. up this ship and, and I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll send it off on a course somewhere else if it's autonomous. But, but even if I can just lock it off so that the crew can't properly operate it uh, until you transfer X number of Bitcoin into my account and then I'll unlock it. Yeah. Yep. That's interesting. I, um, I don't know. This stuff kind of fascinates me because it's not like we haven't been, you know, we've been doing this for hundreds of years, like shipping lanes and, and, and ports of call and everybody bringing in their stuff. And it's been there as long as we've had, boats and, and seafaring technology. Um, but I do think it's, I don't know, weirdly time that that all got in line with really great security options, not just in the ports, but on the ships themselves. Yeah. And if I was in charge of any of that, I would want to do it sooner than later. As long as, long as we've had ships, we've had pirates. So yep. I guess this shouldn't surprise it. Uh, also, I want to apologize for using the word boat improperly at the beginning of this conversation. I knew it as soon as it came out of my mouth. 
It's all right. Oh, because a ship and a boat are different. I called a cargo ship a boat in in passing. Yeah. Like two well, ships that know. pass in the night, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Our seafaring audience supports and accepts your apology, Tom. Thank you. Yep. My dad was in the Navy. He would be appalled. There you go. Yeah, mine was too. Uh, on Tuesday, NASA's Rocket Lab su- successfully launched the 55-pound capstone CubeSat, which is designed to orbit the moon eventually. This is part of NASA's Artemis mission to send humans to the moon for the first time since 1972. We have been talking about it for a while, y'all, and people are getting close. Rocket Lab used an ele- electron a rocket with an add-on called the Lunar Photon Upper Stage, which has the power to send it into deep space. Electron is a small rocket. It's made to launch a payload to lunar orbit. That's what it's made for. It launched from Rocket Lab site in New Zealand's Mahia Peninsula, and Rocket Lab t- told TechCrunch recently that it's the highest mass and the highest performance Electron has ever had to fly by quite some margin. So they're pretty happy with the results. Capstone will orbit Earth for nine days. That's in order to generate enough speed for a translunar injection, or TLI, and if all goes to plan, it will eventually be able to orbit the moon. The Gateway Space Station is the next mission. That would be SpaceX delivering it as a science lab and living quarters for astronauts and ports for future spacecraft. Yeah, so so a couple of things going on here. The Electron rocket itself uh, is pretty cool, uh, and the capstone being a tiny little CubeSat out there pioneering the orbit for the eventual SpaceX delivery of the Gateway Space Station uh, pretty cool as well. Here we here we go. No space pirates yet. Yeah, not yet. Right. We've had since seventy two to work on this. Hopefully, we have a few ideas. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. St- I I've been very skeptical of the Artemis mission, but it's starting to look like maybe it'll happen. We might yeah. actually see people set their feet on the moon again, which is pretty sure. exciting. Well, right, y'all have fun the up there. <laughs> Sarah will oh, not yeah, be, that's right. Sarah not be going. Sarah's feet. Yeah, no but, sign I'm not going to the moon. You let me know if it's fun. <laughs> and if it's made of Swiss cheese, that's all I care about. Yeah. Uh, yes, over in the mailbag, Thor from Bohr. Uh, who, who, uh, Thor says it's uh, sunny and delightful in Bohr, Norway this time of year. Thor says, just wanted to add on to the tips on what to do when you want to avoid tracking data while still using helpful tools on your phone. This is uh, a conversation that we had with Lamar Wilson on the show yesterday. Thor says, maps.me can download maps offline to your phone. That allows you to turn off all communication, but you can still route with GPS. Since GPS is the only one-way communication, because you get data from satellites, but you're not sending anything back, you can get directions without sharing your data. Maps.me can store a log of your location history locally, but that's a feature that's off by default although it is a feature. But if you really want to be sure, you may want to wipe the app's data after you're done using it. (laughs) And Thor finishes by saying, sorry for not waiting until Thursday. I hope Scott can forgive me. I'm emailing from a Viking market, if that helps. (laughs) Okay, so it's an old, we made a reference (laughs) last week just briefly about Thor and Thursday. And I think only about half of you got it because it was a very quick little quippy dumb idea. I'm just- I I actually didn't. Full disclosure, yeah. I was it's like, totally I need fine. the joke explained. Thursday to me. is named after Thor. Thor's day. Yeah, it's Thor's day. It's Thor's uh, day. Yes, yeah. but yeah. today so is Odin's it. day. Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. But it's Which okay. Is... We could still read Thor's email on Odin's well, day. And Thor might be listening by Thursday. <laughs> That's right. So it all works. Very good point. Very yeah. good point. Also, a very yeah. good tip from Thor. We should not lose sight of that. Uh, this is Maps.me is great. Obviously, if you have GPS on, you want to make sure nothing else on the phone is also taking that location and logging it. Any of your other apps, so you want to limit the other apps. Uh, but but great, great idea to use that and and just say, like, you don't even log my location, but now I could still use it for, for navigation. Thank you, Thor, for that. That's awesome. Indeed. Thor, you're the best. If you have feedback, if you have tips, if you have questions, anything we talk about on the show, we would love to hear about it. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send that email. Uh, Thanks to you, Scott Johnson, for being with us today. Even if it's not Thor's day... It's always a great day with Scott. Uh, what's been going on since we saw you last? Well, lots of stuff. Uh, I'm going to tell people to make sure they check out my core video game podcast called Core. Uh, it's all about video games for the modern era, whether we're talking about consoles or PCs or whatever. And the reason I want to point you there is because for whatever reason, that show has been popping. New listeners all the time, all kinds of great conversations. And everybody keeps telling me how much they love it. 
So I believe them. And if you want to be like them and find out for yourselves and you're a gamer and you want more and better gaming podcasts, check out Core every, everywhere you get your podcasts. Or if you want to get there directly, just head on over to the website. It's at frogpants.com slash C-O-R-E. That's Core. And uh, for everything else, ping me on uh, Twitter. I'm Scott Johnson over there. Excellent. Uh, we, we, we always thank new bosses when we get them. Uh, and we thank longtime supporters. And sometimes... Somebody gives us a raise, and we'd like to thank them as well. So we'd like to thank our boss, Brian, who did give us a raise. Uh, Brian sent in a real nice note uh, that Cameron, his son, has been enjoying Good Day Internet, and we're happy to have them along for the ride. Uh, apparently, Cameron was the one who said, you know, you should give him a raise. So Brian did. We also would like to shout out Jackie the dog as well, because Brian sent in a dog photo, and that is 100% appreciated at all times. Yeah, as I understand it, Brian said, "I've, I'm, you've got five dollars. Uh, who do you want to give it to?" And and uh, we were the first choice. So, uh, so yeah. really, Cameron's a new boss if you look at it that way. Indeed. Yeah. Yes. So yes, let, thank, let's thank, thank our brand new boss, Cameron. Thank you, brand new boss, Cameron and Jack. Yeah, awesome. yeah, could be you tomorrow. Are you going to be the next boss? Let's find out. Uh, speaking of Good Day Internet, uh, GDI rolls right after we wrap up DTNS. If you want to know more, patreon.com slash DTNS is where you can find out. Just a reminder, we do the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are back again tomorrow because we do it every weekday. Justin Robert Young will be with us then. Talk to you soon. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>